In the last section, we learned about the UI router library and how to create and bind controllers and templates to different routes, as well as expose them through our HTML using the UI view directive. In this section, we're going to expand on our understanding of the UI router library by looking at things like substates and state parameters. To get us started, I've created a simple index.html file containing that div element with the UI view directive attached to it. I've also kept the temp HTML file we created in the previous section, and I'm going to add a few elements to it. The first is a div element that will encapsulate my table element, and I've attached another built-in Angular directive called ng-show. ng-show will only show the element it's attached to if the expression assigned to it evaluates to true. Conversely, ng-hide will always show the element that's attached to it unless the expression evaluates to true. So in this case, my table will only show if that name variable is equal to undefined. Otherwise, it's going to show that div element with the UI view directive. This also means that we need to add a name property to the $scope object in our myController function. We'll leave this property undefined for now, but we'll assign a value to it in a moment. The next thing I'm going to do is define a new state in our application, and I'm going to name the state temp.widget. By starting the name of the state with the name of another state we've already defined, followed by the dot operator, it indicates to our UI router that this state is actually a substate of that other state. So widget is going to be a substate of temp. The template URL and the controller look very similar to our convention with the temp template URL and controller, but check out our URL. We added something a little bit funky there. We have that forward slash widget and then forward slash name, but that name is contained in two curly braces. What that means is that that name is actually a state parameter. It's variable. Whereas widget is static, we always have to have that forward slash widget. That forward slash curly braces name can be whatever we want it to be. And that's extremely useful because take a look at what happens when we wire up our widget controller. We add it to our application. Then we inject two objects into it. The first is that dollar scope object we've been using, and the second is an object called dollar state params. This is an object provided by UI router. And when we define our widget controller down at the bottom, we activate it by setting the parent name property of our scope to the name property of our state params. So we actually grab that property, that part of the URL, that name part of the URL, and assign it to our parent's name property in our scope object. And that name property in our scope object is the exact same name that we're referring to in our myController function. That's pretty cool. So when we go back into our temp.html file, if our name is undefined, it's going to show this table because it's in that parent state. But if it is defined, if we've assigned a value to our name in this scope, that means it's in a child state. So we need to display that child view. And that child view is our widget HTML file. And what's in our widget HTML file? It's just simply our dollar parent.name that we assign when we visit that URL. Now there's one more thing I want to do before we render this in our browser, and that is I want to make our child states accessible from our parent state. And I'm going to do this in two ways. The first way is by converting our first table data element into a button, which will invoke a method that will take us to that particular state when it's clicked. And of course, this means that I need to define this method in our myController function. And to do that, I'm going to need one more dependency, which is the dollar state object provided by the UI router library. And of course, I pass it in as a parameter to our myController function. And then this go to widget function is going to invoke the dollar state objects go method that accepts two parameters. The first is the name of the state we want to go to, and the second are the parameters that we want to include in that call. In this case, I want to go to the temp.widget state, and the parameters I'm passing in are just the name parameter, which will contain a value of whatever is passed in as the parameter to this go to widget function when it's invoked. So for instance, in the temp.html file, the value it's going to pass in is the name of the particular widget that we click on. The other way we can make our child states accessible is by using that UISREF directive that we learned about in the last section. 
And here, I simply pass in that temp.widget as a method call and include an object of the parameters that I want to include in that state reference. When we go to our temp URL, we see that our buttons and anchor tags are properly wired up. And when we click on one of them, it takes us to the appropriate URL for that particular widget. But something fishy happens when we click the back button. We're back at the temp URL, but now we don't see that table that we did when we first visited it. This is because our name property of this template scope is not undefined anymore. There's one more thing we need to do to ensure that property gets reset when we go back to our temp view. Let's go back into our files and figure out what that is. And the way we're going to fix this is by adding an event listener to our root scope that listens for any state changes in our application. When a state change occurs, it's going to update the name property of our MyController's$Scope object with the new state name parameter. So I'm going to add the $RootScope object as a dependency to our MyController function, which of course will pass through as a parameter as well. And then I'm going to add that event listener. And I'm going to do this by calling the $on method of the $RootScope object, which I pass in the name of the event that I want it to listen to, in this case, $StateChangeStart. And after it finishes that state change, it's going to invoke the callback function that sets the name of our dollar scope object to the name parameter of our new state parameters. It's very similar to what we did in the widget controller where we set our parent scope's name in that case to the state parameter's name. But unlike the activation function which only runs once when we first visit that state, this event listener will run continually every time our state changes. Let's go back to our browser to make sure this actually works. And indeed, when we click on one of the widgets and then click the back button, it updates properly. And that's because that name property of our scope is updating each time the state changes.